Is he here? Or he left? A lot of sugar tonight. <laughs> yeah, but these are zero sugar. Yeah, it's not just zero sugar. <laughs> zero added on top of what's there. Sakalachi for everyone that brought to share. Because of this specific line where it says, when they thought there was nowhere to turn other than Allah, and la malja'a min Allah illa ilayh, thumma tanba alayhim. Then Allah did toba to them, Allah turned to them, liyatubu, so they could turn to Him. And we made a point yesterday about this, and I think this is uh, important for us to kind of stamp in our hearts. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets you do something good, it's not that you did that, it's that He willed good for you. And that's why you should be more thankful the more good you do. Like right now, if you're here at this time, it's one o'clock in the morning on a Friday night, we know what people do at one o'clock in the morning on Friday nights. It's not that you chose to do something good, it's that Allah wanted to gift you. So He brought you. The Allah turns to the servant first, then the servant makes told. That's why we always have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's Him that attracts us to Him. We don't get attracted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we did something good. Rather, if Allah wants to pull us to Him, then we feel an attraction. And so it's a great blessing of Allah Jalla Jalla. This is everything, even the even hip of Qur'an. You know this is something in the Qur'an. If you ever meet a half of the Qur'an, even if they're not the best person, you should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the book in their heart. That was not their choice. Allah says in Surah Fatir that He chose people to memorize His book. And then He broke, broke them into three categories. Minhum ظَالِمُنْ لِنَفْسِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسِبْ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقُنْ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ We're not going to do the commentary of those eyes, but I just want to make a point. You meet someone that's half of Qur'an, right? It's like I remember when we were studying Quran, one kid was wrestling another one and he like he threw the one kid down and then and then he ran away. And when the other kid went to grab him and he went to tackle him, he said, I'm holding a Quran. And then he said, Oh, he let him go. He said, In my heart. And then he ran off. <laughs> so that way he didn't slam him, because he said, because he thought, you know, if he's holding a mushaf, you don't want to throw someone down with a mushaf, right? So he said, I'm holding a Quran. And then he was like, he let go of him to see where he's holding him in my heart. And then he ran off. So he's a smart kid. He got away. Too. He was fast. Good enough. Good. So the point is, if, if you meet someone, you should. Uh, that's why the hadith mentioned honor the people that memorize the Quran. Even if they're not the best people, Allah still subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them. Parents can't choose this. This is a choosing from Allah. That's why we have to ask Allah, Ya Allah, to put in our family and our lineage people that memorize the book of Allah. 
Choose some of us. Because even those that did dhulm on their nafs, what did Allah say in the Quran about them? He called them ibad, my servants. He still called them my servants. Meaning they're still from the munajum. It's mentioned in the tafsir, they're still from the people that are saved, those who memorize the book, even if they oppress themselves. So, same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody converts to Islam, you're like, oh, how did you become Muslim? What's your story? That's all nice to know, but at the end of the day, Allah selected that person. You have to know that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected that person. Yeah, maybe there's a goodness in their heart, maybe there's a illa, a reason, but still, it's the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will yet to be He will bring a people. He will bring a people. And that's why they say, and this is going to hurt some people's feelings. A sign that your ibadah is accepted is the more ibadah you do, the more gentler and the softer and more merciful and compassionate you get. Not the opposite. That's a sign that your ibadah is being accepted. That you're, because ibadah, ubudiyya, is slavery. It's about going down. Right? And so the more you do worship, the more humble you get. This is something we've seen with some of the Amazing, subhanAllah, as they got older, they got more humble, more gentle. It's not like their ibadah or having a bigger following made them more arrogant. No, it actually made them more broken before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So keep all of that in mind. So we're very thankful to Allah for all of that. So our path is fueled on the bottom page six by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His beloved. And it's founded on shukr. So it's fueled with love. That's the fuel to the vehicle of traveling ahead that we love Allah. And what's the foundation that you're moving on is shukr, gratitude. To be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The more we are thankful, the more Allah increase us, increases. And the highest maqam in the maqamat of the ten maqamat is maqam al mahabba the maqam of love. Okay? Even in human beings, the highest connection between you and another person is love. <coughs> There's many reasons humans have to build relationships, but love is the highest, right? And, and, and when there's love, the Prophet said, it blinds and deafens. Could be for good, it could be for bad, but it's a, rea- it's a reality and effect of love. People fall in love, sometimes over a silly reason, sometimes over, over a valid reason. The point is, it's gonna blind you and deafen you. The Prophet said so. And that's how we should be with our Prophet No one can speak bad about him in our presence. We are deaf to it and blind to it. We're not hearing it. Ya Jamalu, Ya Jamalu. It's all beautiful. It's all beautiful. And we'll find a way of interpreting it to make it beautiful. People don't like it, that's not our problem. That should be your perspective of the Prophet and anyone you love. So he says here, this is done by, dis- by the describing of the two wings that the Murid soars with the, uh, to his Lord, to Barak wa Ta'ala. The first wing is the character, the second is the worship. What is that? Tawfiq. And we ask Allah for Tawfiq. The Murid's comportment. Comportment is an old English word that basically means how you carry yourself, your adab. It's muru'a wal akhlaq. It's having nobility and good character at the same time. That's comportment. And it was actually a grade in America, and the, up until about the 1980s, it was a grade on report cards. And it was the heaviest grade in school. When they took that out, then, then you could have an A plus student, but he's a jerk. But it was actually considered a grave for a very long time, Adam. So we use the word comportment to kind of try to revive that word. It's a nice word for Adam. Chapter 1. Introduction to the inner struggle. Because this is about the khlaq. So for people to have good character, there has to be a struggle there. Right? Before the Murids can begin their path towards moral reformation, they must first understand the importance of mujahad, struggling. Because good character is going to be by struggle. And I... And I'm going to give you guys some insight about yourselves. Pay attention, because this is spiritual. They call it the soul of spiritual psychology. Every single person in here probably, to a certain degree, thinks, I'm going to use one of the characteristic traits we have to try to achieve. They think they're patient. Why? Because they feel they're controlling themselves to a certain degree. So therefore, according to the degree that they're controlling themselves, they think they're patient. But in reality, just like you have a threshold of pain, their threshold of patience is very low. So they're like, I am being patient. Like, but somebody whose threshold is very high looks at the person like, they're not, you're not having someone. Have some supper. Like, no, no, I am being patient. How long do you want me to be patient for? It's like the man who was right, he was beating up his servant, and he said, the Prophet when he went to raise his hand, 
He said, I felt a hand grab my hand because he went to raise his hand like this. And right before he struck him, he felt a hand grab his hand. He did not strike his servant. And the Prophet said, he realized it was the Prophet's hand. His name was Abu Mas'ud. He's not related to Ibn Mas'ud. He's a different one. Abu Mas'ud. And he said, you know, Allah has more right that he could take justice upon you than you could take on your servant. If this is what you want, you want to live by the sword, you want to live by justice? It's like, it's, it's like Shakespeare said that in this world everyone cries for justice. On the day of judgment, they all cry for mercy. Even Shakespeare knew about that. So he said, then he said, Ya Rasulullah, how many times do you want me to forgive him? Like, I'm trying to be patient. How many times am I supposed to forgive the guy? As much as you want Allah to forgive him. You know what, then you have, now, look at how shaitan will come. Yeah, but how are we going to fix people if we, don't, if we don't tell them what's wrong? I'm like, how many people have you been able to fix your own life? You haven't been able to fix yourself. You're going to go around with concern with fixing other people? We can make announcements every single prayer not to double park. There's going to be a person going to double park. We can still make the announcement. We should make the announcement, right? But the point is, it's, we should know very well that people aren't going to change because we first have to change ourselves, first and foremost. And so the Prophet said, said, forgive him as many times you want Allah to forgive you. According to the amount that you want Allah to to forgive you, sometimes you have to be patient in certain situations. There are certain situations where you think you're like, you know you're pushing. That's the third time you said that. But maybe someone else, you can say it 40 times and they still have patience. Their threshold is higher than your threshold. So don't ever think you've reached the maqam because you're struggling at your maqam. If you're drowning in a two-foot pool, boy, you know I want to say a kayaking joke right now about how much you, but I'm not going to because we're recording these. That was the joke. If you're drowning in a two-foot pool, and then someone's like, stand up, and then you stand up and you stop drowning, you're like, oh, no one helped me. I thought I was drowning. The water's below the knee. That's like some people are like, you know, I'm trying so hard to be patient, but I'm only a human being. Like, no, you're not trying. You're lying. Try a little harder. When was the last time that you were angry you went to a cold shower? Don't tell me you're trying if you didn't take all the steps. When was the last time you said, Khalas, can I just need to take a walk. We'll talk about this when I come back. You go out and take a 40 minute walk. They say 40 minutes, then the endorphins kick in. 40 minutes, healthy endorphins kick in, negative, uh, negative energy leaves you. 40 minutes, go do it one time. When you're really angry, take a 40 minute walk. Tell the person, you know what, hold that thought. I'm gonna argue with you, just give me 40 minutes. <laughs> I'll be right back. Go take a walk, come back. And they'll be like, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> right? If 40 minutes you show up there, you're still angry, take another 20 minutes. Then come and say, I mean, I'm working on my patience. Don't say I can work on my patience because you, you were patient for a few seconds. So this is in everything. So it's like, I'm trying to do as much ibadah as possible. I'm reading one juz of Quran. Our threshold needs to be pushed. All right? Healthily, in a healthy way. Alright, keep that in mind. So he says here that for the righteous deeds are always accompanied with opposition for base desires. If they often require removing one's comfort in order to serve a greater purpose. Yeah, it's true. Throughout our entire lives, we have succumbed to the quests of our most basic desire. With Mujahada and Muri will find themselves fighting the lower nefs by reducing their own internal state of discomfort. You know, Imam Ghazali wrote in one of his books, The Greatest Khadir, you know, the greatest treachery. You know, you khadirun Allah. Their nafs. Their nafs. Look what Allah used in the Quran. The greatest treachery is your nafs. It tells you, okay, let's, let's eat a little bit now. Let's sleep a little more. Oh, they upset you. Defend your honor. What did they say about you? Ah, oh, this person's going to make fit You better do something about it. You better do something about this. You better do something. After everything you gave in, as soon as you turn your back, you have stabbed you. <clears throat> your own nafs stabbed you. You said, I thought we were good together. You made me miss Salah now? You got me into a fight with my spouse? You got me angry at my kids over something I shouldn't have been angry about? I thought we were supposed to be friends. Next thing you know, the nafs stabs you in the back. That's why the Prophet said, A'adhikil adu, the worst enemy you will ever have. And if you'd gone to Palestine, you would have fought, he said, Israeli soldiers. But he didn't. He said, you're nafs. He said, you're nafs. 
It's the worst one. That's the worst enemy. And the problem is you go everywhere with that thing. You go everywhere with it. That's a hadith, the worst enemy. You know what people do when they have serious enemies? They put, like, like right now, the sex is like, oh, there's a strange car outside, and then all the brothers start circling around. It's like they're so concerned, everyone's on their toes, like keep your phone close, to make sure everyone's on guard. But all day long, are we on guard of our nafs? Are we, telling, are, we ta- are we telling our nafs like, not this time. I already gave you some ice cream. I already let you sing for five minutes. You can go back to the message listen to Mark see this. I let you sing a little bit. I gave you ice cream. I even gave you a Gatorade. I even gave you sugar-free chocolate so you think it's, you ain't healthy. So look, we've had a very nice time together. Now, let's do a little ibadah. Rather than the nafs, because the nafs, the more you feed it, the more it fattens. You know? A sumo wrestler doesn't have one cup of rice. They have a whole bag of rice. So that's how the nafs, the nafs can't be like that. You know, laziness, they say, is, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I wish we had the Prophet so it mixed us physically, subhanAllah. But I'm that. And it's like, you know, yesterday when I mentioned the thing about the man said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm lazy and I sleep too much. So a, a righteous person said, uh, what did the Prophet tell them to do after that? I said, you made dua for the person and it was gone. And I said, well, I guess we don't have that. You know, like that. Rasulullah was here to say, Ya Rasulullah, we're lazy, make dua for us. He said, Ya Allah, remember their laziness. Next thing you know, wow. Just like that. And the brother was at the end of his life, he said, ask me now because I'm leaving. So a man came out. Ya Rasulullah, this. Oh, make dua, gone. Ya Rasulullah, send me the Nisan. Man never lied after that. The man said, I lied, Ya Rasulullah. I'm dishonest. If you're not even honest, Ya Allah, protect his tongue. Never let him lie again. Never lie again. I'm lazy. Ya Allah, remember his laziness. Sleep too much. Just gone, right away. SubhanAllah. But, alhamdulillah, you know, we still have the Prophet amongst us. There's no doubt about it. And the reward that we get for, you know, the reward that Sahabas get is commensurate with their sacrifice. We're not, we don't have to lose limbs and eyeballs and family members. So yeah, they had amongst us him, but they also suffered greatly. Our suffering is, is like, you know, like, can we turn on two ACs? It's getting hot in here. Show me tomorrow, we will, you know? That's like the, the, the extent. So Ghazali said, he, you have to be very careful. The nafs will try to trick you, right? And the nafs, for each person, they call the nafs stupid. And the reason it's called stupid is it's repetitive, right? But, of course, if we keep falling for the same trap, then who's the simpleton? Sun Tzu, in his book of uh, war, he wrote, he said, if you know your enemy and you, know, and you don't know yourself, you've won half the battles. If you know yourself but you don't know your enemy, you've won half the battles. If you don't know your enemy and you don't know yourself, you've lost all the battles. And if you know yourself and you know the enemy, you will win every battle. That's why these books are so important, <clears throat> right? I'm not saying it to say rah, rah, the book. Really, well, why? I mean... This, this was put together by a few brothers over like seven years ago. It took us a long time to actually finally say, okay, let's print it. Because we weren't sure about our intention. It's not about the book. It's about the importance of this topic. Understanding yourself. Like really reflecting over yourself. Making life decisions. Ask yourself, am I a cultural Muslim? No offense to anyone's culture right now. But whatever culture your mom and dad is, you ask yourself, am I a cultural Muslim? Or am I really down for Allah and His Messenger? You have to ask yourself sincerely. And then, and, then, and then start to think about certain things, habits that you have to break. There are habits you have to break. So there are nafs. al says, and he likens this fight in the Hayat al to the bending of a folding paper in the opposite way, in order to make the paper straight against it. Dr. Smaid, it's written in the book, May Allah Preserve Him. Now we say, May Allah have mercy on Him. So, May Allah have mercy on Him. Echoed these statements with his famous line, which he usually quote. This is a quote of a Shafi'i, but we attribute it to him because that's who we heard it from. But a Shafi'i was the first one to say this quote. There's two steps into paradise. The first step is on your nafs, the second into Jannah. The second into Jannah. People can have their opinions about people, but I'll tell you something about this man. 
this man had completely stepped on his nafs. And anyone who spent private time with him, they, they would know that. He completely stepped on his nafs. You could almost count the amount of words that he would speak. And from the, from the nafs, the most enjoyable thing of the nafs is talking too much. A lot of times we think nafs is sleep, sexual desire, and food. Actually, talking is the worst one. And it's the one that the nafs is, is fueled in all the other areas. Any of these things that the nafs, if it's done in a halal way, there's nothing wrong with it. And even, excuse me for saying this, I'm going to say it openly, this is not, this is, this is ta'aleem, there's no hayat in the religion. But, you know, when you're married and you have a healthy relationship, it's actually considered the only thing in the nafs that softens and draws the heart closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's part of the, 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 the positive aspect of the nafs, not negative, as long as everything is done in a correct way. Same with food, the right type of food, the right amount of food, the nafs is encouraged to do more. But anything imbalanced becomes a, a, a difficulty. And so this man really stepped on his nafs. I heard firsthand from somebody who said that he said, and this was about maybe seven years before he passed away, it's been 30 years, I haven't walked out of the bathroom except I came out with wudu. 30 years he was, he didn't leave the bathroom without wudu. 30 years. And that would include if he got up at night and went to the bathroom and then would make wudu again. That's stepping on your nafs. You know, to leave Medina to the Munawara and come to America. Do you know how hard it is to leave Medina? See, some of you are like, mm -hmm. you know. Because once you spend a few days in Medina, you're like, oh, this is life. Uh, this is what life is like. This is actually human life. You know, like in the last trip, the one that we went with all the youth in October, you guys remember that? They came back, we entered into JFK. Oh my God, it was like from paradise straight to hell. As soon as we got there, fire trucks, police cars, get out of the way! Boom, boom, you're beep, beep. Like, remember? Yeah. You're like, ah, hold on, we'll get to that. You're in Medina, it's like all tranquil. The loudest thing is the birds. That's the loudest thing in Medina is the birds. Right? And everything in Medina is blessed. Those birds don't go to the bathroom in Medina. The cats don't go to the bathroom in Medina. They go behind the hotels. They have so much edam. Mm. The cats of Medina are awliya. I'm not kidding. Well, I am not, not kidding you. I could tell you stories about those cats. One of my friends had a... He, he said, he, this was a true story. This just happened not too long ago. There was a shape from India that fell in love with one of the cats there. He said, I'm taking this cat home. He took the cat to the vet, he fell in love. There's a lot of cats in Medina. They all have lineage to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi They all go back, they're all his cats. I'm not kidding you. They're from his time. Abu Huraira is the imam of those cats. Every cat in Medina, they're just, they're the lineage. They're the ansar of the animals. The cats and the birds are the aus and the khazars of the animals. And so he said, he's not taking the comb. So he, he had the vet do everything to the cat. He's getting ready, he was gonna fly out the next day. Now, he heard the story directly from the sheikh. Always told me the story. Always, he told me the story. He said, the sheikh came to him the next day. He said, I saw the school of the last in my dream. The cat was sitting on one side of the court mm. case, and the sheikh was sitting on the other side. And they set up a court, and the prophet was the judge. And the cat said, Ya Rasulullah, this man wants to take me from Medina. He said, having a court case in his dream with a cat. And the Prophet said, and he turned to the Shaykh and he said, I have been taking care of all of these cats. These are my cats. You can't take them from Medina. And he hit the mallet. The, is that what it's called? The, he hit, boom, struck the, the qabr, the decree. He woke up from a dream. He put the cat back in the haram. He didn't take it home. You don't take the cats out of Medina. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they're very special animals. Uh, everything in Medina is special. There's a narration that comes and picked up the dirt and said, Wallahi innaha la mu'mina. I swear by Allah, this dirt of Medina is a believer. Wallahi innaha la mu'mina. The heir of Medina is a believer. <coughs> so he, okay, why am I saying all that? Because he left to Medina to come here to America. Based on a dream of the Prophet Sallallahu that's called stepping on your nafs. You know the Sahabas, out of 124,000 only, at most, at most, the highest opinion is 30,000 stay between Mecca and Medina. It's always those 9,000, 10,000. 
The rest of them left Medina. Do you think they wanted to leave Medina? They left so that we could be sitting here one day and having durus about the Prophet ﷺ. If they didn't leave, most of your ancestors wouldn't be Muslim. That's a sacrifice of the nafs. The Mashaykh of Tusulf maintained that one's consciousness is divided into two parts. A ruh when nafs. Meaning, there's five parts, but it's broken into two parts. The ruh and the nafs. The nafs present, but then we have aqal. I mean, we're just making it very simple, okay? This is not complex stuff. You have a soul and a body. So he says here, the nafs presents itself in three conditions. Each condition defining a person's innate nature. They are. Again, this is basic. There's three here, but there's actually more. There's seven. But these are the three most basic ones. This is an introductory book. Alright? Nafs al ammar the first one. This is the lowest type of nafs. And we're going to share a few things about nafs al ammar and then we'll stop after that. The nafs al ammar is the lowest form of the nafs. Okay? Ammar comes from the word amar, commanding, the commanding nafs. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Right? Nafs al ammar you're sitting in a dust, and your nafs is like, you're tired, go to sleep. You're like, no, I'm going to make you stay awake. When, when, the, when we're done learning, we can go to sleep. But I'm keeping you awake right now. Nafs al is like, oh, come on, please. How do you get you know, to sleep? And this guy keeps saying over and over again the same stuff. <laughs> all right, we heard all this. We know all of this. Just let's go to sleep. You're like, no, I'm not going to sleep yet. Rabi al we mentioned her earlier today. She used to stay up all night and she'd tell her nafs, after sunrise, I'll let you sleep. Don't try this. All right, because we're not Rabi al yet. After sunrise, she started dozing off, and she said, I know I promised you, but I'll tell you what, you stay awake for me now, I will let you sleep as long as you want in the grave. So she would trick her nafs again. She'd start the next day like that. Shh. Rabi al Huh? Say again? <laughs> so she's not yet, that's how they were. She would only sleep sitting sometimes, that's how they were, but we should, we should sleep. No, you do. You know, just you guys can sleep. We're not Rabbi Lalu. There's a lot to be said about her. She's a really special woman. Subhanallah, very special. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was gifted. You know, Maryam was gifted to the Beit uh, Maqdis. Rabbi Lalu's father took her uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, presented, and said, "This is my daughter. I'm gifting her to you, Ya Rasulullah." And he had a dream the next day that Pope came and he said, we have accepted your gift. We accept her. <sighs> At this stage, the soul and the nafs, the, the nafs and amara, this is the lowest form of the nafs. The nafs and amara commands to the soul in all matters of life. Whatever it defame, demands, it will receive. Food, sleep, lust, talking, whatever, arguing. Nafs al amara who loves to argue. This level of the nafs is often likened to a toddler or a child. See, toddler or child, look at screams and cries. I don't know why, I just saw Cedric right before my eyes. Like, <laughs> screams and cries, we don't think their way. We all love him. Right? Yeah, he wants his way. You want to study nafs al amara Study our answer. Then he will teach you nafs al amara When he wants something, he's going to get it. That's a great quality, by the way. If, if it's used for good one day, he'll become like his mama. Ah, what an amazing individual, right? I mean, we can all agree to that. That's a determined man. That's someone who made a decision, and they did not look back. I am an ayatullah. Sign from the signs of God. Really, the signs from the signs of God. And if it wasn't exposing, I would share something very personal, but I, but I, wouldn't, I would not think he would approve of it. But if I did, you guys would not want to sleep tonight if you heard what I was about to say to you. Say no. Because <laughs> I don't have permission. The point is, that's nafs al amara You will get your way. Right? <clears throat> nafs al amara no offense to the lawyers. I mean, like, you know, that's like, my sister's a lawyer. Nafs al amara is the best lawyer. See, a good lawyer, a good lawyer is not about finding truth. It's about making their point true, even if they're wrong. A good lawyer, I mean, O.J. Simpson, the glove literally, I mean, like, 
it doesn't get pretty more obvious than that, right? Allah knows best. We know we shouldn't say that. I take that back. The point is, a good lawyer, I mean, it was pretty obvious, but Allah knows best. A good lawyer can make the worst situation look the best, or a best situation look the worst. The same thing, subhanAllah, the same thing that someone would fight against, a good lawyer, when they say it, they'll support them in that. But just the way, the way they have their sophistry. So it's not about truth and falsehood. It's about what I'm going to present, I'm going to convince you it's true. That's nafs al I'm going to convince you this is good for you under every circumstance. Right? Nafs al It'll get you every single way. That's why and in Imam Busaidi, when he likens the nafs, he likens it to a lawyer. And he said, don't listen to the lawyer because you know that it doesn't have goodwill for you at the end. It doesn't intend good for you at the end. You know very well how this lawyer is going to be. It's going to pull you the other way. So that's nafs al amar And here's the sick thing, and then we'll close after I share some, a story about Araf, the people of Araf. And this will be a good way for us to remember the story of Araf. In the story of Araf, there's, 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 there's the, the, the people of Araf. Right? There's, these people are the people of the balcony, or the people of the height, or the people that are well known. There are different ways you can translate it. There's a place, see, Jahannam is a low place. Jannah is in a high place, metaphorically we're speaking, right? But then there's an interspace between. That interspace between has access to both heaven and hell. It's called Al Araf. Have you heard this term before? Where did you hear this term before? In the Quran. In what surah? Surah Araf. MashaAllah. Very smart. Surah Araf. These are difficult questions. So in Surah Araf, that surah is named after this group of people. There are different hadiths and opinions about who these people are, but the summary of them is they're a group of people who their judgment has yet happened. So they're between hell and heaven. They're in the waiting room. You understand? Like people went to paradise, went to paradise, and people went to hell, went to hell, they asked Allah for safety and security. And then there's a third group called Ahlul A'raf, al Jan, a group of quote unquote men, but they're people, they're going to be between. So these people of A'raf are going to be between. And some of them will be people between prophets, some will be people, khalatu amalan saliha wa amalu sayyiyah. They had a life that was mixed with good and bad. So one night they came and they sat here, and one night they were at the bar. The next night they came back to the masjid, the next night they were at the bar. The next night they came back, to, so their life is, they have two lifestyles. And they end up dying on these two lifestyles. So they have two, right, lifestyles. They're living a spiritual lifestyle, and then they're living a shaitanic lifestyle. So they go to Araf until their judgment happens. I'm going to summarize what the verses say. I'm not going to quote the verses verbatim. But they basically say that when they arrive to Araf, the first thing they do is they turn to the people of paradise. And they say, Salam alaikum to the people of paradise. And the people of paradise return the salam. And they're very kind to them. They're very kind to them. These ayahs come right after Allah uh, uh, condemns arrogance, by the way. If you go to Surah Araf and look closely, he condemns arrogance twice and then says the story of Araf. So these people on Araf, they say Salaam Alaikum to the people of paradise. Salaam Alaikum, right? The mercy of Allah be upon you. And then they make Salaam. The people of paradise give a positive response. And they have a nice discussion. And then they look at the people of hellfire. So they have a window. This is the first time we know of like, you know, in the history of mankind, the idea of like FaceTime. So they're looking here and they can go in one direction. And then they're looking at another direction in a different place. So they look at the people of Hellfire. And the people of Hellfire enter because, I'm sharing this whole story for one reason, to bring the point of Nafs al They are there because of the Nafs al And because they never, ever, ever matured out of it, they still have to deal with Nafs al And even in Hell, they still have Nafs al People of Hell argue all the time. Look at the end of Surah Zukhruf. Look at the end of Surah Saad. Look at the story of Araf. They're arguing. The people of hell are always arguing. The people in paradise, they don't argue. They're having a great time together. They're eating chocolate, they're eating candy, they're singing pasidas, they're having a great time. Right? The Prophet walks in. 
everyone gets so happy. Like, how does your love? They start saying, like, they're so excited, right? They get to meet all these people. It's a great time. Paradise is beautiful. And so the people of Araf then turn to the people of hell, and the people of hell says, Allah will never have mercy on you. Look at their state. Look how pathetic they are. They're burning in hell, and yet they still don't want other people to go to hell. Mm. Because they never fix themselves, they're busy pointing. They're still pointing faults to other people. Like, you're being punished right now, and you're still concerned with the faults of people. Like, that's a sign they deserve it. May Allah protect us from the hellfire. Allah will not have mercy for you people. As soon as they say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, enter my paradise. Oh, you want to criticize the people that off? All of you go to Jannah. Now they're really in remorse. Look how sick they are. After they go to paradise, you know what the people are off say? Now they get, uh, they, get, they get a window into paradise. So now they get to look in paradise and they say, can we have a drink of your water now? Now they have hope. In Allah haram ba'al kafirin. Allah has made it forbidden for the ungrateful people. You, had, you made it in hell, and on top of that, you wanted to put the people of that off in hell, and then when they put paradise, now you want a drink of water? After all that? Get the lesson now, boys. Get the lesson now. Now you get the lesson, right? Stop criticizing people and start criticizing yourself. Stop pointing out people's faults and start looking at your own faults. Start having an eye of mercy towards people and be critical of yourself. Start supporting people in their wishes and their desires in becoming better and don't hold people back because of your pathetic state. Don't do that. Just because you've had problems in your life in a certain area, don't force your problems on other people. Because we all may have a certain level of trauma and there's nothing wrong with that. And Allah, may Allah heal all of you. But don't make your trauma other people's trauma. I'm not saying don't get help from people. But don't sit, because you had a bad experience in something or in somebody or in some situation, like you had a bad experience in a masjid, go tell, don't go and tell other people, oh, don't go to masjids. You go to masjids, oh, the people there are not nice. They're like, because you, like, you had one bad experience with somebody. So now you turn people away from Allah's house? Don't do that. This is not the way that our Prophet was. And that's why that new teaching that came out of that Saudi oil, contractual British money, has destroyed many, 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 many young men. It is, it is the greatest innovation in Islam right now is the Salafi teaching. It is the greatest innovation. It's the newest teaching that's going against 1400 years of Islam. And some people are like, you know, you keep talking about them. Why? Because look at the fitna they've caused. Look how many people they've turned away. We see in Qasidus like this, they are bid'ah and everything. How do you feel when you say praise of Allah and the Messenger? Did you feel closer to the Prophet? Did it make you want to be more like him? Is it permissible in Islam? It's absolutely permissible. It's not only permissible, it's sunnah. And yet they criticize it because they misquote a hadith. The hadith says, Ibn, and I'll end with this hadith just to teach you guys one a hadith. It's in Bukhari. If you fill your jawf, meaning your stomach, to your throat with poetry, it's, it's, it's worse than, than, than uh, filling your, from your navel to your throat with vomit, filling yourself with poetry. They quote the hadith. Go read the commentary of the hadith. Ibn Abi Jamal says, first of all, he said, the Prophet said, Sha'an, and he put Fathatayn on the word Sha'an, which means a specific type of Sha'an. You wouldn't know that if you didn't study grammar. You can't know that from an English translation of the hadith. You have to study five years of grammar to know that ten, the two ten means on that word means a specific type of poetry. And Ibn Ibn Jamal said the fact that the Prophet used to love poetry, good poetry, the fact that he built a mimbar like that in the masjid to sing poetry of his praise in the masjid, the fact that he told Anjasha to recite a thousand lines of poetry means it's not all forms of poetry. He's talking about lewd and bad poetry. He's talking about modern rap. It's worse that you fill yourself with vomit than to, than to put that stuff in your body. But they misquote the hadith and they say, oh look, it's haram to do poetry. And these guys do poetry. You didn't even know that what the hadith means. And the Prophet said, whoever, whoever, says a hadith, whoever says one of something about me that I have not said, and this is the most authentic hadith in hadith literature, let him pick a place in the hellfire. Not only does it mean that, but it means to misunderstand the hadith. 
How do you misunderstand the hadith? You go to the back of the masjid, you open Bukhari, you read a hadith, and you start quoting what it means, and you never sat with the teacher to study it. And so that's why we're vocal against it, because we don't want people to be turned away from Allah and His Messenger. Our goal is to bring people to Allah and His Messenger. Right? Not to our nafs, to Allah and His Messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in His love for Him and for His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take this small group of young men and maybe a few sisters and probably a cat or two or whatever is in the building right now, maybe a bat, and make them the representatives of carrying this prophetic mission. If you guys study the Sahabas closely, you will see these people were absolutely crazy for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will make you uncomfortable how much they loved him. And so if anybody says, oh, these people love the Prophet too much, or they say, they, you, you haven't seen Sahabas fight over his wudu water. You haven't seen Sahabas in Sahih al-Bukhari say, Ya Rasulullah, let us do sajda to you. The camel did sajda in Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet said, no, it, it, that's not permissible. But they wanted to. And guess which Sahaba asked that question? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, we have more intellect than the camel. And I saw the camel do sajda to you. My intellect is saying, the camel figured that out. Let me do such a to you. No, I won't have to do such a to me. Abu Bakr asked that. La qarabata ali bayti, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To make the family of the Prophet happier, is it, to make the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more pleased, is more happier for me than if my own family becomes pleased. When Abu Bakr's father finally became Muslim, He's over 100 years old. Shaykh, he's an old man, gray bearded. Abu Bakr carried, he had to carry his father, Abu Qahafa. He fought against Abu Bakr his whole life. He criticized the Prophet his whole life. He was an old man, he almost was dying. He brought him to the Prophet and he carried him. The Prophet wept, he said, Ya Abu Bakr, we would have went to your father. Why did you bring him to us? He's so old, he had to carry his father. He was so old, he had to carry him, like, you don't bring an old man like that to me. I would have went to him. Ya Rasulullah, my father's ready to become Muslim. He became Muslim and Abu Bakr cried. He said, Wallahi, I would be so much happier if I would have heard Abu Talib say the shahada than my father on this day. Mm. I'd be so much happier. That would have made me more pleased, Ya Rasulullah. His own father. If you love your father more than you love the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi your iman is incomplete. Mm. If you love your children more than you love the children of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your iman is incomplete. If you love your sisters or your brothers more than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's sister Shayma or his brothers Hamza Radulam in milk, then your iman is incomplete. If you know more about your friends than about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's friends, your iman is incomplete. If you know more about your city than his city, your iman is incomplete. If you know more about he, your life goals than his life goals, your iman is incomplete. And that's the haq, whether you like to hear it or not. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and revive our hearts and make us real bearers of the prophetic message. Make us Muhammadi. Make us like the Prophet said. The greatest mistake that the Founding Fathers ever made was when they didn't know the name of the religion Islam properly and they said that freedom of religion is for Christian Jews and Muhammadans. I thought that was a great mistake. I'm so thankful they used that word. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Mm. Yes, we're Muhammadans. We're followers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I hope they never fix that. Leave it like that. Leave it like that. Huh? You never change it. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yeah, the pen has been lifted. SubhanAllah, Forgive me guys if I said anything offensive, that's not my intention. Allah knows we don't mean to, but sometimes you gotta, you know, we have to say these things. And this is the time when the hearts are most open. You can say things in Ramadan that you can't say outside of Ramadan. Because Shaitan's not here to be like, do you know what he meant by that? He was talking about you. He won't do that, because he's locked up. Here you'd be like, you know what, SubhanAllah, let me rethink about this stuff, maybe. Maybe he's right. Maybe he's not. Maybe I'm not right. But Allah and His Messenger are right. And Imam Malik used to say whenever he gave fatwa, he'd say, Wallahu alam. And ultimate truth lies with the one that's over here. And he'd point towards the grave of the Prophet. Allah and His Messenger, the ultimate truth is right there. 
That's where ultimate haq is. I'm just giving my opinion. So Allah knows best. Subhanahu wa ta'ala.